I'm Robert Rosenthal, board member and former executive director of the Center for Investigative Reporting. I'm a longtime journalist, uh, and I was a foreign correspondent in Africa and the Middle East. And now it's my pleasure to introduce our distinguished guest, Bernard-Henri Levé. As many here know, Bernard is a French philosopher and public intellectual who has wrestled with the most important issues facing the West for several decades. He's written 30 books, and he, in his career, has also done films, and for close to 50 years, he's gone to the story, uh, whether it was in Bangladesh, Bosnia, most recently in the Middle East, spending a lot of time in Kurdistan with the Kurds. Uh, his new book is The Empire and the Five Kings, America's Abdication and the Fate of the World. It tackles the retreat of America from a global leadership position and the countries who have risen to power in its place. So, good evening, and welcome to the San Francisco and the Commonwealth Club, and we're going to begin our conversation now. Uh, this book is a fascinating book uh, that looks at a raw, big cross-section of issues, but it really begins uh, from your uh, spending time with the Kurds in 2015 and, and last year. And your thesis really is, if the fate of what has befallen the Kurds uh, has, was really shows, the, in a sense, the betrayal of American values and the rise of power and the attempt to fill the void created by that betrayal and really going backwards uh, of the five kings, uh, who the five kings represent China, Russia, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, and Iran. So can you talk about, as we begin our conversation tonight, uh, what, what really led you to write this book and the main message you want readers to take away from it? What led you to, what led, uh, what led me, and first of all, welcome back. I was here two years ago, I think, or three years ago in the same Commonwealth Club, so I'm happy to be back. Uh, what led me to, to write the book is exactly what you said, Robert. I was in uh, Kurdistan uh, one year and a half ago with my um, friends and companions, uh, the Kurdish fighters named Peshmerga. I knew because I had filmed them for one year and a half the role they played in defeating ISIS. I knew that they were the best allies of uh, America and of Europe. I knew that they had uh, spilled their blood in order to defend us and to um, prevent us from spilling our own blood. And when the time came to recognize the merits of each other, maybe to, to reward those who, who fought best, instead of rewarding them, uh, America and Europe abandoned them and offered them on a silver plate to Iran, Turkey, and their allies in the area. So I was, of course, morally shocked. I, was, I found that it was a political mistake, both political and moral, but it was a starting point of my reflection because I was there and I saw militarily, politically, uh, these five powers which Robert was just quoting, moving forward, pushing their advantage as if America did not exist, as if America had vanished in the air. It was even more than an abdication, even more than a betrayal. Erdogan, uh, uh, Khamenei, the supreme guide of the Iranian revolution, Putin, and the Chinese, Xi Jinping, were acting as if they were back and as if we were back very strangely, mysteriously, to a sort of pre-Christopher Columbus world. <laughs> and this was the start, really, of my book. This was the stemming, the, the stem cell of uh, this book. So the part one is devoted to America, my love to Amer for America, my belief in the American belief, my creed in the American creed, my feeling which I had all my life that I would just not live without, uh, I would, would, just, would, just, uh, would just not exist without um, America 
having felt 74 years ago, that five years ago that it had a mission, which was to fight for freedom and to fight against fascism. Uh, the first part is about that, the greatness of America, the greatness of the American creed, this very special um, state of a country which believes in a sort of chosenness, what does it mean? Is America an imperial nation or not? Can we speak, should we speak an, uh, of an American imperialism or not? In which sense? All that is the first part. The second part of the book is about the five kings, which are five authoritarian states, enemies of the values of freedom, liberty, human rights, equality between women and men, and so on, and who have the three peculiarities, A, of having been in the remote past empires, B, to have seen these empires collapse, and three, C, uh, point C, to dream again because of this American vanishing in the air of a return of their imperiality. So what about these five powers who are hoping, dreaming of denying the law of history that wants that, what, when an empire has collapsed, it never comes back. Since Polybus to Toynbee, through Montesquieu, Gibbon, whoever, all the theoreticians of the fall, of the rise and fall of empires know that when an empire collapses, it never comes back, except these five guys, Erdogan, Putin, and so on, now, at the moment when I'm speaking, read the New York Times every morning, <laughs> they believe that maybe their time has come back. So, as you just referenced, uh, there's a tremendous amount of uh, history in this book as well, from the Greek, Roman, Persian empires. But more recent history, uh, and let's go back to the 1920s and 30s, and you know, America first, isolationism, and that period of time, the rise of potential, the new empires you want, or the people who thought they'd have thousand-year empires. Uh, what what do you see the analogy to that period now, and what do you see happening coming ahead? I mean, you lay out the scenario of where we are now, the attempt of the five kings, and to a sense, you know give rebirth to their, their beliefs from their ancient empires. What do you see happening in this period now, if you look at what happened, came out of the 1930s and 20s? First of all, um, I am um, old enough to have seen the remnants, the ghosts of a first totalitarianism that was the Nazism and the fascism. Okay, I'm old enough to have seen the a second stage of totalitarianism, which is communism and Stalinism. The 20th century has known the Nazism, has known the communism. I think that today we are facing the return of the same usual and old suspect who are these five kings. This... Uh, a more or less alliance. It's not an alliance of spirit. It might be sometimes of spirit, sometimes of interest, of these five powers, for me, have the same importance, may have the same consequences for the future of the world, may have the same weight as the communism or the fascism in the past. It is the third step of uh, the same story. First. Second, about America, I strongly, uh, I take very seriously the fact in, in this book that recession to recede in your language has two meanings. It has a political and military meaning to withdraw, to step back, and it has an economic and financial meaning, a recession. So what I believe is that those in this country who believe that for the sake of the national interest of America, it is not bad 
to recede from the world, that it is not bad to think America first, are deeply wrong. They think that by uh, dropping their moral duties, they will avoid the economical misery. They will have both the indignity and the misery and the crisis. I really believe that like in the 30s, if the West was to do, go to the, uh, went to the end of this process of receding in geopolitical sense, the West would know a big new way of receding in terms of economics and finance. Politics is a, is a big stage and is a big game. And it's a big game which is played uh, by three players. There is the West, there is the Five Kings, and there is all the in-between area, which is huge. And this in-between area in Asia, in Africa, in South America, where in Europe, they are the, the stake of the battle between the kings and America. And this is a game which has huge political, but also economical and financial uh, uh, consequences. And I believe that the current administration of the most powerful democracy of the West is making a huge miscalculation. And I demonstrate, for example, there is a chapter in the book about China, about the relationship between America and China today. You have on one side a power that is acting, moving, calculating at the scale and on the ladder of uh, centuries, that is the Chinese. The Chinese, they are like the Vatican. Their uh, way of calculating their relationship to history is at least decades. And you have in front of that a Trump administration that is making, that is m making some deals short term for the last quarterly or for the last year that might prove to be good immediately but will surely be very bad on the long term. So if this uh, uh, tendency continues on the same trend, I am very pessimistic. And I am pessimistic, and this is the third, my third remark, I'm not pessimistic only for us, Americans, Europeans. I'm pessimistic for all the peoples in the world for whom American values, American creed has a sense which is taken very seriously. This, this phrase which you know by heart, which you were taught in your, in your schools of the shining city upon the hill. I can tell you, I have enough experience. I traveled in Bangladesh. I traveled in the most uh, record places of Africa. I was in the most uh, dark black holes of the forgotten wo wars of the world. And I can tell you that in these areas, in this depth of darkness, when people, where people live and die as if uh, they were in hell, the light that, drive their, that drives their, their pace, that gives sometimes a little sense to their life, that gives them hope, is this idea of a shining city upon a hill on the coast of the Atlantic Ocean. So for all those people, for my Kurdish friends, for my, the Pakistanis women, whom, or Afghan women, whom I interviewed a few years ago when I investigated about the death of Daniel Pearl and who are escaping, who are trying to avoid the so-called crimes of honor, who are fighting for human women and human rights for them, 
this abdication of America, this topic of America first, this idea of an America forgetting its sense of chosenness is an absolute tragedy. And this is the, one of the senses of my book and one of the reasons why I wrote it. Uh, you said, I think you said you're, uh, you're not optimistic uh, about things, but the book ends also with some hope. And I think, you know, the pushback towards to the, against the authoritarian, the rise of the authoritarianism globally right now, not just here, uh, you know, in Europe, obviously it's everywhere. Uh, what, what's the anecdote to that? What, what, what's the thing that can push back on authoritarianism? This book is not pessimistic. Uh, I don't think so. It's not pessimistic, number one, because in every, in each of these five powers uh, rising the head, you have a lot of people who fight, who believe, who hope, and who share our values, number one. Number two, because, um, as I said recently on the television show of Bill Moher, uh, the American democracy is strong. Uh, Donald Trump is nearly nothing compared to the strength and the vibrancy of the society in America. And... Um, America is much bigger than any episode of its life. So, no, I, I am optimistic because I see, uh, I'm here in this country since uh, two weeks and a half, I see the vibrancy of the democratic life. And in the book, I, I articulate I try to find the roots of this democracy, to depict them, and they are very strong roots, and they will survive in an attempt of, uh, I don't know, of forgetting them. They will survive. The roots of, of the American creed, the roots of the democratic values, whatever blue or red states, it's not, uh, this book is, a, I, I think so. I, I did not write it for a camp against the other one. And I, I remember having had a few weeks before his death a conversation with Senator John McCain. Uh, he was a Republican. If I, had been a Demo if I had been American, I would probably have been a Democrat. But we shared so many values. And... Um, and we, and he knew the few of the hypotheses of this book. We had had a debate in Washington DC just before I began to write it. I know that it can be on the, on the right side or on the left side or the, or the opposite. I'm optimistic because the American democracy is much stronger. It's like a wall, a real wall on which, yeah, the real wall is this one, the wall on which any authoritarian attempt will break its head. And I can tell you, Donald Trump, you will see that very soon because of the machinery of democracy is working. The Mueller report will be published soon. The democratic investigations are going on. This is a wall of concrete on which he might break his, uh, if not his head, at least a few of his temptations. Do you, one of the things that's happened in this country, really pushing back against uh, a lot of the political things coming out of Washington is many, many people, especially young people, are really activated to try and make a difference and get engaged or involved in things they care about. Do you see that happening in Europe and in France too, on a, in a, on a political level, in terms of the shifts in the parties or people getting more engaged in politics or issues they care about, whether it's the climate or whatever is happening in their communities? What, what I see in Europe, unfortunately, uh, is uh, a lot of people who enlist themselves in politics, but in the wrong side. I mean, on the populist parties, 
populists of the extreme right and populists of the extreme left. And this is undoubtable. You have uh, blowing on the whole world and, the, and on the whole West a wind of populism which is um, very strong. But in front of that, yes, you have some uh, young people who react, who resist, and who, and who fight. Um, and um, I remember when I, when I released my, my documentary about um, the Kurdish fighters, I, I, I had debates on this occasion with big crowds of European young women and, 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 and guys who just asked, what can we do to help? What can we do to support? Is it possible to join even, uh, even on the battlefield? Yes, of course there is that. Do you, is, there in, is, there, is this an opportunity? I mean, we have Brexit, which you can maybe discuss from your point of view a little bit, but also the European Union. Is there an opportunity now for the European Union, for Europe to lead? And is there a leader uh, who you admire, who see, could maybe take up the leadership to really push back on, on what you see happening? You remember in America, you had 15 years ago, uh, an intellectual named Samuel Huntington who spoke, who invented the concept, who popularized the concept of a clash of civilization between, he said, between the West and the rest, as he said. I attacked at this time very strongly this philosophy, this opposition between the West and the rest, and I continue in this book to say that any attempt of this sort is a, a way to ignite fire and wars and is a way to divide humanity in a racist way. But there is two clashes which I take very seriously. One is inside what Huntington called the rest, and in particular inside the world of Islam, between the fundamentalists and the Democrats, between those who want the, the ladies to be uh, enclosed, to be, to be uh, enclosed in jails of, t of, uh, of tissue, and those who want the women to be equal of men, for example. There is a real clash between an obscurantist Islam and an enlightened Islam. I have here, as a first rank, one of my oldest friends, Mr. Rafi Hussein, who is a citizen of Bangladesh. We met 50 and something, 50 years ago, 51 years ago in Bangladesh, and his people in Bangladesh is the exact embodiment of that. You have in Bangladesh a prime minister who is a lady, you have a real democratic conception of Islam, you have a real, a true tradition of enlightened Islam, which is the enemy of the Islam, of the Mullahs, of the Muslim brothers, who you can see in Turkey, in Iran, and so on. But you have also a clash of civilization in the West between the Democrats and the populists, between those who have a, a conception of Europe, because that is your question, based of, on ethnicity, based on borders as much closed as, po closed as possible, based on the refusal of the otherness and of immigration of one side, on one side, and the Europe, based on liberal values, based on openness, based on uh, brotherhood, based on, liberal, uh, on, on democratic values. So today, you have the two Europes, as you have two Americas. And there is a very strong struggle going on between these two Europes. Between the Europe, let's say, of uh, I don't know how, to which extent the names are familiar to you, but 
the Europe of the Italian Salvini or of the Hungarian Orban on one side, and the Europe of Mrs. Merkel, Chancellor of Germany, or French President Macron, between these two Europe, there is a fight, there is a war, which is a life and death war. To the last blood, it will be a terrible fight. One of the two politically will not survive. I can <laughs> predict that to tonight, but more than predicting, I demonstrate that in the book. So who are my, my I don't have heroes, uh, in, in uh, heroes it's another story, but uh, who do I support? For example, Chancellor Merkel. In front of the question of immigration, she acted very bravely in a very Kantian, Immanuel Kant way. Uh, she, she washed, she, she, she sort of washed a little part of the shame of Germany due to the past by welcoming refugees coming from Syria. And President Macron is not bad too in his uh, way of addressing this populist tide, in his way to betting to open so on, on open society, in his way of refusing the old ghosts of nationalism, he embodies also this uh, Europe which has to prevail if she wants to remain faithful to the dream of its founding fathers, of our pilgrim fathers, and for example, of one of the characters of my book, the German philosopher Edmund Husserl. So on one side, you have our kings, and on the other side, you have people like Merkel or Macron. Uh, one of the things that I found fascinating in the book of themes was about really technology and information and the control of information historically, uh, whether it was the town crier or someone taking messages on horseback, the printing press when it was created, radio, was the control and the abuse of information and, and how it was distributed. Uh, now, uh, you know, some of the greatest literature of the 20th century, I know you know Grossman, Basley, Life and Fate, you know, Every Man Dies Alone, these books, Aaron Hype 400, 5451, it's about really control. Now we're in the age of technology, and in your book you describe meeting someone, I think maybe 15 years ago or so, who I would like you to tell, you, tell us about, because I found him a fascinating character, Jean-Baptiste de Croix Vernier and how you met him and what sort of he sort of took you on a path. And I think some of the things you learned from him or saw that led you to, uh, today I think you were down at Google. So can you tell us how you met him and sort of about what his influence was on you? Yeah, he's a, he was at this time and he's still a young uh, engineer, um, young genius, and now tycoon of the internet. He's a French uh, equivalent of, uh, of your big companies. And uh, yes, there is his portrait in the book and he taught me two things very soon. He taught me, number one, he did teach me that the internet created a huge monster which was in the process of devouring the society itself. The link between brothers, the friendship between uh, friends, uh, the cement that makes uh, society possible. He taught me very soon, 15 years ago, that the internet was like a cannibal plant like an, um, a cannibal uh, herb that was ready to, 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 to destroy the inner heritage of the centuries, the, the world of intelligence and of knowledge. He taught me another thing, 
which is that the internet was putting into motion a system of voluntary slavery unknown, uh, unconceivable by any of the master thinkers of the past. He made me understand, and the book is full of that understanding, of course there is a big part of the book on that, that the internet proposed us a sort of social contract where we accept, we, we, we abandon a bigger part of our privacy, of our freedom, of our sovereignty than the watch that was required in the old social contract. And we do that because of a mutual interest that is described in my book. And he taught me that this new social contract based on a permanent watching of us by the powerful, watching of the powerful by us, and based on the watching of each of us by his neighbor, that this makes us a system of indiscretion, of transparency, which is potentially um, responsible of uh, unknown state situation of um, slavery. The internet is pregnant with that, with a system of voluntary uh, uh, slavery, which Etienne de la Boétie, Wilhelm Reich, all the theoreticians of the, of the voluntary slavery could not even imagine. And he taught me a third thing, which is that, as always, you have to fight the evil with its own weapons, <coughs> that in front of such a revolution, you have two options. One is to withdraw, to go in the catacombs, to go in the ca back in the caves, to disappear. There is an article in the New York Times of this morning about the people who decide to recede, to step out, to disappear. It is in the New York Times, and it is described as a metaphysical choice in this part of my book, too. And you have those who decide to fight, who decide to resist, and who decide to do that with the very weapons who are created by those who invent this terrible and uh, diabolic system of slavery, which is my choice. I have a Twitter account. I have an Instagram thread. I have some Facebook pages. I used these weapons when I launched a campaign against the sentence of death stoning for an Iranian lady. I use these weapons when I want to make um, more hearable, more heard, the voice of the damned of the earth of Kurdistan today and of other places before. And I try to use these weapons to convince those who, who made this revolution to correct themselves, to, to repair. And you know how for a Jew this idea of reparation of tikkun olam is important, to repair the harm they themselves did. So this is my... I describe this world of social media as a possible nightmare. Uh, I describe it as a, uh, also as some tools 
for a possible democracy. And again, here, it is a battlefield where we have to wage our for our liberty and for our values. And this is what I try to do for myself and what I invite everyone to do also. Uh, one of the things you write about in the book uh, is human nature, obviously, and, and the internet in a way plays into it. You just describe your, your strategy or your tactics for pushing back against you know, the darkness, the diabolical part of it the control of, of the authoritarian, of, of the information and how it's used and abused. But I, I really enjoyed in the book where you, I'll read about undergarments, because you taught, you really, it's human nature in a sense, because the, the technology, we all want to be showcased in a way. We want to know everything. We want to know secrets. And I'm, I'm going to read uh, something from the book, and, and you're describing, this follows a section where you're talking about with the, I think the emperor has no clothes effect. And you're right. And now, because since the dawn of time, there's never been anything more exciting than rifling through the dirty laundry, not only of the king, but our neighbor. We give permission to do the same with ours. There is in this a circular voyeurism that is at the very least obscene. It is a corrupt bargain in which the parties agree to share the right to spy on each other and, ipso facto, to denounce each other. In this alliance of the naked, this symbolic exchange of the pleasures of seeing and being seed is the title deed of a new type of social contract in which it is no longer our freedom or our will that we are agreeing to, or to limit, but our privacy. So, you know, it's really that this incredible technology played into a human trait. And you then, in the book, also talk about something called the panoptagon that was a design of a prison in the early 19th century. And I'm from Philadelphia, where I worked there for a long time, and I've been in that prison. But can you talk about the panoptagon and the thinking behind it and how it's relevant to today? Panopticon is the, is the name of a model jail, a perfect jail, invented in the 18th century by a man called, an Englishman, called Jeremy Bentham. The panopticon means a system of watching when you have a, a central tower from which every uh, prisoner of the jail, like in a sort of, uh, like rays, can be observed from the tower watch. And Jeremy Bentham invented this modern jail. He proposed to, to generalize this system of a central tower, allowing the man inside to watch circularly uh, everywhere. He proposed to, general, uh, to, to, to generalize this model to out of the jail to the factories, to the hospitals, to any place in the world when there is a humanity with, which has to be domesticated. And he said that this panopticon system is at, at the same time the most efficient and the one that requires the least efforts and means the most economical in terms of means, and the most efficient in terms of result. This is what Jeremy Bentham invented. You have one jail in America, which is a jail in Philadelphia, which Alexis de Tocqueville visited, which, exactly, which obeys exactly to this pattern. My theory in this book is that Jeremy Bentham is the true inspirer of the inventors of Google, of Amazon, of Facebook, of Twitter, and of Apple. The famous GAFAM, the real, uh, the one who really secretly guides their hand, guided their, their pace when they, invented, was, when they invented that, was Jeremy Bentham. Of course, when I tell that to them, they are a little surprised. <laughs> the most, they are very clever people. 
of course, they are learned. Uh, so very often they know uh, the name of Jerry Bentham and they are surprised. But when they read the book, they are a little less because I think it is, uh, it is um, undoubtable. So Jeremy Bentham, for me, is this philosopher called an utilitarian who at the, at the same time invented the perfect jail and who invented the idea that um, mankind had to be um, uh, uh, ruled with the biggest pleasure possible. Jeremy Bentham said that, number one, the rule of pleasure, and number one, and number two, the rule uh, of um, domestication. This Jeremy Bentham is the secret master of the world of technology today. This is, uh, you have uh, 30 pages demonstrating that with a lot of results, concrete results which can be refle reflected, meditated, by those who today rule these social networks and these electronic tools. I hope they will. But in the, in, in you writing the, and I found this section fascinating. Uh, I'll read one paragraph again. But Bentham conceived the simple idea that it is enough for a person to believe that he is being observed and possibly seen through, even if the panopticon, panopticon is empty, to get that person without force and even without words to bend and submit. So it also can be the basis not only of we want to share everything, but if you think you're being observed or someone's spying on you or telling you of the totalitarian state or the authoritarian. And I think that also ties into the methodology you describe with the five kings, where they abuse, they turn, flip it. And you talk about uh, the, the way the Chinese, can you talk a little bit about the way the Chinese, you said they've not only, their technology, I think it's called Baxed, right? The Chinese Baidu, Alibaba, et cetera. So what have they, and so the abuse of that idea is also something that is very insidious and it's happening today. No, what I demonstrate, what I try to demonstrate, and I think I achieved to demonstrate, is that uh, the dream for transparency and the dream for purity, the will for purity and the will for transparency are the two legs on which any totalitarian state walks. I demonstrate that for a democrat, for a liberal, let's say, uh, uh, an absolute article of creed is an, an, an um, un impossible to negotiate a revendication would be for each of us a right to secrecy. Democracy means a rule of law, means uh, human rights, means uh, separation of powers, whatever. But it means also the right to secrecy. The right for each of us to have a part of shadow or a part of night, which is an intimate part of each of us. And the first, the first and the last gesture of any totalitarian state, of which the Chinese state today is the latest form, is to go inside this part of secrecy, to put the light in this area uh, of shadow or of night, and to, to make us transparent to the power or to each other's. And today, we have in China, I described, I try to describe that at length. We have the final embodiment, probably final, at least the most elaborate embodiment of this will to make the souls, the bodies, the destinies of each human absolutely transparent. And this is the fulfillment, the, li the latest fulfillment of the totalitarian dream. There is a French poet who is very dear to my heart, who, is, who was Charles Baudelaire. And he said in a very provocative quote in one of his uh, poem in prose, he said, I, I quote that in the book, he said that 
he would like to add to the Declaration of Human Rights made by the French Revolution three rights. The right to le, le droit de se contredire, the right to contradict yourself, le droit de s'en aller, the right to go away, and the right to have a part of sacred, unviolable, impossible to rape part of secrecy. And this is so actual. The right to go away in the Muslim world, for example, it is the benchmark. The right to step out of the faith, of the community of worshippers, that's crucial. When uh, um, one of the, of the key points for the world of Islam, and you have a lot of Muslims who think like, like, like I say it now, and who believe in that and who want that, one of the key points will be, is today and will be in the future, the right to enter and the right to go out, the right to step in and the right to step out. The right to contradict in the West is an absolute um, uh, requisition and condition of, uh, of a free spirit. Uh, a free spirit is someone who is able to be something else than the simple soldiers of a battalion uh, whose orders are dictated from outside. This is a real freedom to be able to, and this is the thing, by the way, which I reproached 10 years ago so much to the, 12 years ago, to the American neocons. I told them, but when you go to the restaurant, do you take all the menu or do you choose? You are not able to take all the menu of a, a political program. And the right to secrecy, the right to have this part of night, this is the absolute uh, rock of resistance opposed to any authoritarian or totalitarian state. This is what Baudelaire said. This is what any dissident, any free spirit in China, in Turkey, in Iran, in Saudi Arabia, or in Russia, thinks and lives in his flesh, in his personal flesh and personal soul. I think uh, one of the things, I'm going to segue now into another area, truth, facts. You call, in the book, you said, basically, the, in a way, you say the death of brave old truth. And you talk about, in a beautiful image, uh, truth lying like a naked body on a table and driven by a cannibalistic, cannibalistic impulse, we set to pulling it apart. Each of us stitched together a patchwork of beliefs and certitudes from bloody shreds that soon began to rot and stink. So in the book, you call Trump Mark, and Mark Zuckerberg uh, the two blades of a pair of scissors that is cutting the fabric of truth to ribbons. Do you want to expound on that? <laughs> <laughs> yes, there is, this, is, this is an important chapter uh, for me, an important chapter of the book about the, the crisis of the very idea of truth. And we are living that. Uh, the truth has never been a simple idea, of course. There, is, uh, there has never been a truth with a big T, uh, which was so simple to embrace. And um, you, uh, I could quote, uh, I could uh, evoke and quote so many dictators who uh, um, organized their dictatorship on the belief, on the big truth with a big T, of which it was supposed to be the real uh, 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 the only one to be to be involved with and so on. But what we are living today is the fact, is the collapse of the truth. Is the idea that there is no difference between the truth and the and what the Greeks called the opinion. And what I try to what, what I explain in the book is that this crisis of the truth has three uh, sources. Uh, one is uh, political, 
One is philosophical, and the third one, the last one, is technological. The political source of this collapse of the truth is the history of recent despotism and populism. This is the thing which George Orwell predicted a long time ago, and which has reached probably a peak and a climax with the populist leaders of nowadays. When uh, Donald Trump says, the day of his inauguration, uh, when he replies to a journalist of, I think, CNN, who tells him that there is a, a smaller crowd for his inauguration than for Obama, and when he says, okay, this is your fact, but I have my fact, this is your reality, but I have an, an alternative reality, he arrives to a, a sort of end of a long process that started ages ago. You remember, for example, uh, in the time of the birth of fascism, when Goebbels in Germany, even if it is not comparable, said, I am the one who say who is Jew and who is not a Jew. I am the one who says what is a fact, what is not a fact, and so on. So there is a long history of, um, which is a political history of this manipulation of truth, which uh, leads to the collapse of today. Number two, there is a philosophical history of this crisis of truth in which I try also to, to enter, uh, which has another um, uh, scansion with um, another temporality. Uh, the big names of this story are probably Nietzsche, Heidegger, the French deconstructionism. You have a whole history of thinking that makes vacillate and shiver the idea of a common truth which could be embraced and worshipped by ladies and gentlemen, by people of the South as well as people of the North, as by people of today as much as people of yesterday. A sort of relativism of truth a sort of um, um, a culturalism drawn to the extreme, that the result of which is to say that the truth is just one opinion among others. <coughs> and you have number three, the new technology, the digital revolution that started, as you know, and that was great, with the idea that every citizen of the world had the right to express himself, which continued with the idea that every single expression of each uh, single citizen of the world had to be respected, which was fine, and which very soon reached the idea that, regarding the truth, Regarding the relationship to the truth, no one could say to one opinion more to the other one that it, was, it is more valuable or more close to the truth. This is the, the, one of the worst effects of these digital revolutions this idea of an equivalence of the opinions. This idea that between the expert and the fool, between the one who devoted his life to reflect scientifically on a topic and the one who just listened to a crazy conspiracy theory, that there is no possibility of hierarchy. So if you put the three together, the, the inheritage of fascism and the populist 
theory that there is facts and counterfacts. This relativism and perspectivism, which is the inner heritage of the best of the modern philosophy. And this extreme consequence of the democracy of the opinions, which has been the target of the digital revolution, the three together, create this situation which you I describe in the lines you you quoted, this situation where the very idea of truth has become like a shadow dying at the horizon of our creeds. And this, if we go to really to the end of this end, we'll have some moral, political, and um, living uh, in our very life, terrible consequences, which I try to describe also in the book. So, so this division around what people believe or what truth is, uh, obviously it's fed by the media. And you know we see it in this country where you, know, you basically have uh, the networks or the cable shows, and I'm not sure how it is in France really, are not only coming from a clear political point of view, uh, but also it's what they don't report on. Uh, is there a solution to this? What, what, what's the answer to pushing back on this, this divide? And the divide, the ability or the inability of people to even talk to each other or listen to each other or hear each other who have different political points of view. I think it's one of the most dangerous things in this country. I'm not sure how it is in Europe. But is there a solution to this? Is it around values? Is it around information? Is it about people convening? Uh, how do you bring this divide together? Or how do you even get people to hear each other? There is two, two dangers which are equally uh, fatal for democracy. Number one, the first danger is to, to be, um, to dialogue with somebody with whom you disagree and to transform this dialogue into a war, to consider the adversary as an enemy, to transform the dialogue in, or the debate into um, uh, a war, to transform the space of, um, of uh, exchange into a war zone is the first danger. The second danger, which is symmetrical, is to speak only in safe areas, is to speak and to discuss only with people with whom you agree in advance. And you have that today in American campuses. You have this um, tendency to create some bubbles some safe areas on th of thought in which you will not be aggressed by the opinion of the one who disagrees with you. So the temptation, the, the risk of the, of the war and the temptation of the absolute peace, the bubble of peace, these are the symmetrical ways of escaping what is the real uh, beating heart of democracy, which is a true confrontation of opinions, guided by the idea that there is somewhere out of reach, escaping when you approach it, uh, refusing to be embraced by any of the protagonists, something which is the truth. This idea of a remote truth, which no one of the debaters will embrace, but who, that guides, that is the ultimate, though absent and invisible referee of the debate, this is a transcendental condition of a democratic debate. And this is what is 
refused by those who transform any dialogue into a war and those who escape the dialogue in, uh, by, bubble, by uh, um, uh, cuddling in the bubbles and in the safe areas of uh, absolute agreement. And this is again, really, the two uh, receive the two uh, big dangers between which we, women and men in new dark times, have to navigate. And my book, in this regard, may, I would like, I would love it to be considered as a, as a compass to helping to navigate between these two dangers, between these two, these two terrible temptations, which both signify the, the death of the spirit, the death of the knowledge, and therefore the death of the democracy. Uh, we're, I'm gonna, we're gonna get we're near the end here. We've got a couple of minutes to go. Uh, so I'm gonna ask you one last question. Uh, and hope, you know, at the end of the book, you do talk about hope, and you've alluded to it this evening throughout this fascinating conversation. Uh, but you, I think you used the reference to seed or the grain of sand or the piece of dust, which is part of the hope or the solution. And, the, and really the idea of, of democracy, the idea of what the old empire was. Uh, can you talk about, how, as we end the evening, sort of looking forward, how people can take action and, and how people can make a difference? Yeah, the, uh, arriving at my, uh, at my age, after having done the few things I did in my life, I, I wrote books, I committed uh, deeds, uh, and I gathered some experience. Uh, and I arrived to two conclusions, to one conclusion which is, uh, which is twofold. There are two philosophies in which most of the people around me believe and which have been proved, both of them, wrong. The first one is the, opti is the philosophy of mere and pure optimism. The idea which has been uh, put into the most brilliant expression by Hegel or Karl Marx, that whatever we do, even if we do very little, even if, if we get asleep at the back of the train of history, the history will reach a happy end. This is optimism. This was the core of the Marxism, that history could de uh, know some divagations, it can go through catastrophes. It, can, it could go to, 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 to terrible carnage. But all that was part of the big picture. All that was the ruses, the ruse of the big rationality of an history which is due to arrive to a happy end. This is the optimist sense of history. Very dangerous because it leads, by the way, those who believe in it to admit the carnage, to accept these uh, rivers of blood who are supposed to be the price to pay or the little dark side of the brilliant future picture. There is a second way of thinking, which is the pessimist one. And which could be, if we had, if I had to name one thinker, the one I name in the, in the part of the book devoted to that, would be Oswald Spengler. Oswald Spengler made exactly one century, one century and one year ago, a great book, brilliant, very well written, very well, uh, great architecture of words and arguments, which was called the decline of the West. 
and the theory of Oswald Spengler, Spengler, which is the theory of all the declinists, the declinists, of all the pessimists in history, is exactly the opposite. Whatever you do, even if you, if you try to be brave, even if you try to, to, to gesticulate, even if you keep awake on the first wagon of the first, on the, in the first car of the train of history, whatever you do, history will reach a dead end and a catastrophe. My experience, my, my readings, the blend of the two, of my life and, my, and, and my, my readings, proved me, and the book is really fed with this proof, it is full of this proof, that these two theories are equally wrong, stupid, and dangerous. And I really think, and I give so many examples of that, so many examples which I lived myself in my flesh and blood, which I saw with my eyes, or which I re remember and on which I reflected. Examples of the fact that history is a nonsense to in which real women, real men, real actors can put a sense, can impose a meaning, and can trace a path. And really, since uh, the Greeks, till the Kurds, still a polybus, polybus to uh, my friends, the Peshmerga, the real law of history is that if you want, you can is that the train of history can always derail or can always be put on the right direction if the real actors of the history, those who, who wish and want and dream and nourish utopia and refuse to resign, want it. And this book is a, is a call to to this spirit of resistance, and I really believe that, the, of course, there is resistance to the tyrants. Of course, there is resistance to, to the discouragement. But the mother of all the resistances is the resistance against the sense of history. The, the mother of all totalitarianism is of any totalitarianism is the idea that the history, the being, and the world have a sense defined in advance, of which a few masters are aware, and of which the sense they have the key. This is the real core of any totalitarianism. The Nazis, the Stalinists, and the Five Kings, they share that belief. That there is a sense, that there is a secret of history, and that they have the key of the secret. And on the other side, the true source of freedom, the true source of uh, human resistance to any tyranny is exactly the reverse. It's the conviction that there is no secret, that there is no sense, that there, the only sense there is is the one we will make with our hands, with our will, and with our dreams. And this is a final, probably, word, not of my work. Some books are still coming but certainly of, the, of this book.
Our thanks to Bernard-Henri Levé for joining us tonight. We also thank our audience here on, on radio, television, and the internet. I'm Robert Rosenthal, and now this meeting of the Commonwealth Club, the place where you're in the know, is adjourned. And...